and you will see that uh, I will deal only with human being. I will not look to animals. And I will introduce social science in the process. But you will see that the, at the end of my speech, epigenetics, epigenetics will come again, and it will be a good continuation of what uh, Mario presented us. So, the first thing, I'm dealing with longevity. And longevity, I share the study in two groups. Individuals' longevity, and individuals' longevity are mostly dealing with people reaching 90 and over, trying to understand what are the reasons why they live so long. And at the opposite, we have population longevity. And population longevity, this is area, population, where in average, population are living longer, people are living longer. And uh, doing so, when you put your attention of population longevity, you will have more power to find explanatory variable. Why? Because you consider people that are born and live in the same place. So they face the same environment, they, say they probably share the same genetic makeup, they have the same early life condition, we were talking about famine, this is, they will have the famine at the same time of their life together, and moreover, they are uh, sharing the same traditional lifetime and eating the same locally produced food. So we are in the best condition in, when dealing with population longevity to find the longevity determinant. And uh, what can I say is that if we have to describe the individual longevity, we will mostly look to the age and death. But if we have to describe the population longevity, then we have to go to life table, we have to find other indicators. And among the indicators, one that cannot be used, this is the centenarian prevalence, which means dividing the number of centenarians living in a given area by the total population. This is completely misleading because of migration, because of a lot of things. What we use generally is the probability to reach 100 from birth to death from birth to 100, or if we don't have this possibility, we compare the number of persons that are 60 with the number of persons who are 140 years later, through our census, for example. These are two ways to assess the level of longevity and to compare it between population. Just to have a, gift, a, a small idea, this is the probability to become centenarian in different countries. And on the left you have the female, on the right you have the male. You see a big difference between male and female, for sure. And you can see that the leader, the first one among female are French. French female are really the best to live longer. Second in, in the, for female is Japan and the third is Netherlands. While for male, this is Japan that came in the first line before uh, France and Netherlands again. But look. Our Belgium, for example, is half compared to France, and our Finland is one-fourth compared to France. So we are facing huge difference between countries in terms of the probability to reach 100. So we need to find very strong explanation for these differences. And let's go past in the time about these famous longevity hotspots. It started in an article in 73 by Leaf in National Geographic, and he explained all the trips that he did around the world to find those people living longer. And he has been in Vilcabamba, he has been in the Caucasus, he visited the Bunza in the Pakistan, but what is in fact, what appears later is that uh, Leaf and also other persons finally agreed that they were wrong, and that there were a lot of people have age that were exaggerated in these areas. So the story of these hotspots was appearing during the 70s but was quickly put down by uh, a demographer and other gerontologists. But the key point to identify a longevity hotspot is the validation of the age. And I spent 20 years of my life, scientific career, to validate age in a lot of places around the world to be sure that we are really dealing with long-living persons. Looking all documents that are available to be sure that we are not doing 
an error. Because if you consider a centenarian, and in fact that person is 80 or 85 of 90, you are going in the wrong direction because you are taking conclusions on the wrong population. So I visited a lot of places and tried to understand and to find this longevity island. Look at the story. This is centenarian randomly distributed. This is what we are probably facing nowadays in our postmodern society. Belgium, Netherlands, France, they are mostly randomly distributed and you have low and high prevalence, even if I explain you this is not the best way to measure their numbers. But what we found is that there is non-random distribution of centenarian. And you can see on the right that there are places where you have high concentration of centenarian. And this is the case when I started to work on that topic in Sardinia. On the left, you have the map of the distribution of the centenarian by gender and by place of residence. What I did, first I did the validation of all these centenarian and all was perfect. And that was not expected, in fact, by demographer. Demographer was thinking that it was fully false. No, it was perfect. And I distributed this centenarian by place of birth. And I divided by the number of newborn. And I check how many of these reach 100. And then I use a smoothing, special smoothing methods and I reach to the map that is on the right. That is fully different from the map on the left. And I put it in blue and starting from that point between us we were talking about blue zone. Just because I use this blue marker to shape the, 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 this area on the map. So the blue zone started in 2000, and 2000, 2001, and it took some time to convince my colleagues, it took some time to convince Sardinian, Italian, European, at, at, the, at, the, at the last level, at the world level. And a paper published in Experimental Geontology in 2004 explained this blue zone. And this blue zone is linked to some trait, like, uh, for example, the archaic zone of, of uh, Sardinia or the genetic zone identified by Cavalli Forza. Just to give an example, the blue zone says so strict, the small blue zone has 42,000 inhabitants, and among these, during 20 years, we observe 47 male centenarian and 44 female. So a sex ratio in favor of male, what is really unexpected. And even this sex ratio in the larger blue zone that cover half of Sardinia and mostly the mountain area of Sardinia give a sex ratio among centenarian 1.3. You have to know that usually in our country this sex ratio is not lower than 5. And even in Okinawa it's close to 10. So we were facing a very exceptional situation and we were very sure that in terms of data, the data, the age validation was perfect. So, we define this concept of blue zone as a rather limited geographical area where people are at the same time living longer and on, on an exceptional way and experience, have a common lifestyle, have common and the same environment. So, it's not, not necessarily a remote area, but it should be an area and you will see that uh, in the case of, for example, Sardinia, and we put our attention on a village named Villa Grande. And to give an, an example, this village has 3,000 inhabitants, and if you go and visit the cemetery, you will find 32 centenarians that are buried there. Can you compare this with one of your villages in your country? You will be, it's really amazing. 32 centenarians during the last three decades in this village. And every time I go there, I have to visit one or two or three centenarians. And more than half are male centenarian, and usually very healthy centenarian. This is the survival curve that we did comparing Villa Grande, Italy, and Sweden. You can see Villa Grande is in blue, and you can see that there is a lower infant and child mortality. There is a higher mortality, I will say, due to the war and due to the maternal uh, mortality. That's what you have there. In this case, as it is only male, this is due to the war. They lost 40 of their children in the First World War. 
And we are dealing with generations that were born at the, la at the end of the last century. So they were involved in the war. But look how the blue curve finally go over, cross the curve from Italy and then the curve from Sweden. So that it seems that between, I will say, between 50 and 75, these persons forgot to die. And they reached 90 age of age, 90 years, with the same number of men and women. That's why we published recently a paper, a village where men live as long as women do. This is very exceptional. We found other blue zones. And other blue zones, the second one was in Costa Rica, Nicoya. This is this place in Nicoya. Uh, it's a peninsula. And we have a population there where we found also high longevity and very special condition, very special environment. And we did this in cooperation with Luis Rosero, a famous demographer in Costa Rica. And the last one that we discovered was in Greece. And initially I wanted to go to Creta or Rhodos. But finally I decided to, to choose Icaria. Because Icaria is a very remote island, not touched by tourism, but having a very wonderful way of living, lifestyle and so on. It's about 8,000 inhabitants. It's just between Mykonos and Samos. So we have, up to now, we have four blue zones, and we try to compare them. It's not easy because we have very few data to compare them. But what I can say as a result is that for male, the situation is the best in Sardinia, in the blue zone of Sardinia. It's this 13.3, for four that you have there. But for female, the best is in Okinawa. So you have really two different I will say two different uh, hypotheses. Why the men in Sardinia, why the women in Okinawa? And that brings you to the problem of anthropology, ethnology. You see, you have to enter a new field of competence to try to understand why men and not women in one population and why women in another one. So, let's try to summarize very quickly the lesson that we have from the Blue Zone. First of all, in most of them, this is men that has a better chance to survive with 200. So we have a sex ratio between men and women in favor of men. Then, what we did, we did survey on the holders old in the different blue zone. The number of persons that we surveyed was quite limited, below 50, between 30 and 35, but we checked all the oldest old in the area so that we were able to to assess their lifestyle, their nutrition, and some other characteristics. And the question is, what can we be done in our post-modern society to optimize our lifestyle, learning from this? It's not to say, please go in the mountain and be shepherd. No, this is not the story. This is to see how we can learn from this for our post-modern societies. This is the basic question. Just to say that what we found for sure is the physical activity is intense and it's a regular one. It's not only to go to do sport every week, it's to do it on a daily basis. This is a cowboy and this cowboy is 92. He wake up at 4 in the morning in Costa Rica and very, very active. Very, very active. 92. And this is somebody from Creta. He came back from the forest with the, 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 his wood, he is 95, he is on a donkey there, 95. And another topic, just to come back to active aging and uh, physical activity, this is mostly also linked with the pension in Europe and all the problem of aging and pension. I will not go on this topic, but it's clear that it's linked. Nutrition is another point. There is in each of those places specific food like the red pasta that we found in, North, in South Korea or the goya in, the, in the Okinawa. But I will say that I'm not believing that one of these food may explain the difference in terms of longevity. What I can say is that in most of that place, people experience once in their life caloric restriction. And everybody explained us that they stop to eat when the stomach is at 80% full. They don't eat too much. So this is element. And they avoid meat and processed food. And that's a key point for me. 
I will say that in a village like Villa Grande, you have 90% of the food that is locally processed. That comes from there. That's very important. Why to go so far to, to find some specific food? Why your body is adapted to the food in your country? How is it possible that in Norway, in very hidden valley, we found people reaching 105, 108, eating during their youth and during their middle age only cabbage, carrots, potatoes, and just a bit of meat? We have to think about that, not to, to try to consider that the locally produced food are for us a key factor of longevity. And not, as you see on this slide, the incoming Burger King that will destroy the quality of life. In, but they were very clever. They put it on a rolling uh, a shop, rolling restaurant, to be able to take it off quickly if it doesn't work. These are these persons. OK, they should. We have seen that this center island, he is 104. Every Saturday morning, he leaves home at 5 to go to the market in the city, 20 kilometers, to take the bus. Faustino has a strong sense of purpose, and in all those centenarians, the stress is really, really limited. That's very important. They need to have what we name in Costa Rica the plan de vida. They need to have an objective, to be very positive. This is Felipe, who was 99, he's still alive, and he used this catapult there. He, he showed us a lot of exercise that he can do, and he was 99 at that time. But, and I put it for you just with no comment, when I visited the flat or the house of uh, Felipe, I found on the same wall the Last Supper with Jesus and a pinup from Playboy. Can you see? This is one slide that gives you a lot of reaction that, okay, what is the secret to go and to live longer? One of the secrets is this one. I was impressed by this kiss. I named it the Costa Rican kiss. Both of them are 80. They don't have anything. They have a very uh, a small fire to cook their meat and so on. But they have a love between that. That's the family link and the family support. And look these two. The one on the right is centenarian, is, is congratulated by another one. In this village, you have at the community level a very strong solidarity. The same in Icaria in Greece, for example. And they consider that the centenarians are their treasure. In Villa Grande, they will do a calendar with all the photography of the centenarian. Shall we do this in our country? That's the question. And even, I found one or two, only one or two that, did, that were in nursing home, because they did not have any families and relatives. But even these ones, I found they were very, very, in very good shape. So this is Paolo in Villa Grande, uh, in uh, Nicoya. Let's look about the need for future research. We need really, at the same time, quantitative and qualitative survey that are already in development in both Sardinia and Icaria. And we collect at the same time biomedical and cognitive aspects, and we take also blood samples. So we try to, to catch information on a very multidisciplinary approach. And our wish is to go in two directions fully complementary. The first one, demography and anthropology. The second one, biomarker genetics and epigenetics. Why demography and anthropology? Because the life course is crucial. What was the situation in your childhood? And so on. And for example, we cannot compare people from different cohorts because they have a fully different life course. Just take into consideration the difference that will happen in future between those generations born before or during World War II and those from the baby boom that were born from 45. We will face a strong difference because of the early life condition of these people. So it's very important. We need to understand within this population all the transition. This is the fertility transition, the nutrition, the education, the communication. Everything has changed in one century. When does it change? How does it change? All the story together may help us to understand why some cohort seems to be stronger than others. Why some people are living longer than others. About longevity genes, there is a lot of research. 
we can say nothing in our blue zone. Why? Because our, the size of our population are too limited. We will not be able to say anything. But I am interested to go in the line, in the direction of epigenetics. Because what we consider, and I fully go in the direction of what Mario said before, we have the assumption that the long-lived phenotype is not only the, the result of what you inherited from your parents, your genes, but it's modulated by a lot of mechanisms that are linked to the environment. And those people are sharing a common, very specific environment. So if we really try to link the two, to put together in the same approach epigenetics and demographic nutritional behavioral factor, we will be in a better situation to try to understand the situation. And just to say that we have, for example, two hypotheses. One hypothesis is the role of the shepherd. The shepherd, these are those people who went six months in the mountain, who ate a very specific, have a very specific diet, a very specific lifestyle, and come down at the same time of the year, down and do a baby with their wife at the same time of the year, so that the baby are born at the same time of the year, and those baby live longer. Both live longer. This is very important. <coughs> We will do some anthropological survey to really understand what was the life of this shepherd and what are the characteristics of the children of shepherd, of shepherd of shepherd, and so on. It could be one explanation. What is the and time? What is the time of the year? The time? The time of the year. They come back in autumn, and so the, ch the children will come in March and April. Okay, but that's. If you look the, the, the seasonality of bird in this country, you have really a peak because the shepherd come. But they come very strong, okay? I will not tell you the situation. So, <laughs> the second hypothesis we have is the late maternity hypothesis. In this place and the late paternity, you have to know that the average age, at least last child for a woman, is 42. And for a man, is slightly above 50. Half of the children are born from fathers that are aged more than 50. So, why not to compare the epigenetic traits of this mother that has a early last child with later last child? And to see with their children and so on. A lot of possibilities are open if you put together those things. Just, we have to go in the direction of close cooperation between discipline. And no one discipline can be put on the side. That's for me very important. And that's why we want really to put together these two approaches. And I will say that the situation in our blue zone is exceptional because we have the full story of what happens with this blue zone. And just a last point. It has some policy implication. And as explained already in the paper in 2008, the blue zone, this is not only to study the shepherd, it has a lot of implication of our today daily life. And what happens now is that in the US, they are blue zone community. And I attended in Los Angeles two weeks ago a meeting of these blue zone community. And they tried to see together, everybody was there, 100 persons, citizens, school, uh, student, employer from the municipality and so on, they want to try how to apply the lesson of the Blue Zone within this community. And now 10 community of Iowa are going in this direction. And my question is why not to do the same in Europe? Just two slides to show you. This is a goat in Icaria looking for future. And in Icaria everybody takes time to do everything including they, they like to die. And Antonio Tobe, this is the most uh, clever person, he was 112. He, when I was with him, I took his hand, and I know that he was twice more than me. He was 110, I was only 55. But I feel something important. He has the secret of longevity. Thank you very much. <laughs>